Look, thanks for that uh, introduction. Um, won't comment further on that, but uh, look, um, uh, thanks to CEDA for hosting me again. I probably do a couple of CEDA events somewhere around the country uh, every year because they're such a great forum. Uh, so thanks to CEDA. It's also great to be in WA. It's a place I've been hundreds of times, believe it or not. Um, I'm pretty well around the entire state one way or another. Uh, and I should say there's two reasons I'm here. One is to do this address and the other reason is to visit our Perth office. We've got 35 people there dealing with uh, everything from enforcement to, to Carter airbags. Uh, so I'd like to catch up with them. And yes, it's been two years. Thanks for reminding me, Paula. Um, I've got to get here more often. So look, the topic I've been given today is protecting your data, uh, who is protecting your data? And um, I think the answer has to be largely no one. Um, we do have an office of the Australian Information Commissioner who during this work we've got to know very well. Indeed, we discovered that we're in the same building together in Sydney, so uh, I didn't even know that. Um, and they do a good job with the laws they've got, but as I'll explain, the laws are out of date. And what we've had is a you know, fundamental change in the sort of data that companies can get um, what you buy, where you go, what you're interested in, um, what you're emailing about, what you're SMSing about, sometimes what you're saying. So that amount of data collection is just enormous. And data has become a competition issue, a consumer issue, obviously a privacy issue, a media issue, and, an ad, and, it, and it obviously drives advertising increasingly. It's, it's, data is, is vital for individuals, business and society, so it really is an important topic we need to talk about. I should just add, of course, privacy is not a new issue. Um, for someone of my vintage, when I was growing up in a little place called Lawn, uh, which for those who've never heard of it, it's about an hour west of Geelong, and if you haven't heard of that, it's an hour west of Melbourne. Um, very small town, but back when I was growing up, if you wanted to make a phone call, well, you'd never do it from Perth, because back in those days it was hideously, hideously expensive to do so. But if you made a phone call from one town to another town, say from Melbourne to Lawn, uh, you ring up the exchange, the woman at the, on, on the, in the exchange, uh, you told her you wanted to connect to Lawn, she connected you to the woman in Lawn, and our number was Lawn 54, which pretty well sums up how many households there were in Lawn. But of course, she'd connect you up and then she'd stay listening to the phone call. So she knew everything what was going on in the town. So. Privacy is absolutely not a new issue, but I think it's fair to say with digital platforms it's been completely turbocharged and our laws in many ways are out of date to deal with it and uh, we need to get on top of that. So look, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to our digital platform report, which has obviously brought us into this area, some of the harms that we've come across, so I'll roam more walk more widely than data, although data and privacy is at the centre of it, and some of the solutions we propose. And I'll do that uh, because within about 20 minutes because I'm told there's little bells ring if I don't get off this stage in time so you can all eat. So just the background to it, sometimes I've been asked what's a nice competition agency like you doing playing around with data and privacy issues, and the answer is the government asked us to do an inquiry into um, market power, well that's fine, we're the competition agency. Uh, what consumers understand about data, well we're the consumer agency, so that's fine. They also asked us to look at um, the impact of all of digital platforms on media and on advertising. Um, so that's why we looked at all four of those topics and of course you can't get into these topics without dealing with the issue of privacy. And really it's a fair bit about follow the money um, if you're trying to understand how digital platforms work, uh, then it really is about getting your data and monetizing it. That's their, that's their complete business model. Uh, and so you, you can't avoid that topic when you're, when you're looking at digital platforms. So we, we, we came across a range of, of harms. Um, uh, the main focus was on Google and Facebook, not surprisingly. 19 million Australians use Google. 17 million use Facebook. 
each year. 17 million use YouTube and 11 million use Instagram, which is owned by Facebook. So they are an essential gateway. Uh, and many of the other platforms such as Amazon are a sort of new arrival in Australia. So our focus really was Google and Facebook, although the findings we think are applicable to other platforms once they grow in Australia. And they have an inc Facebook and Google have a huge incentive to grow their profits because their share price is more than 50% explained by growth, meaning if their profits stayed at the current level they are, their share price would more than halve. So they have to keep growing to justify the share price. More than other companies, their share price is based more on growth than it is on uh, underlying performance, expectations of future growth. And of course, they have the incentive to uh, engage in anti-competitive activities. That doesn't mean they are, but they've certainly got the, sorry, the ability to engage in them because of their uh, universal reach. So they do have an incentive and ability to get involved in anti-competitive behaviour. They clearly have substantial market power in Australia. Um, they use that market power to get more and more data. So their data collection comes not just from when you're on the website, uh, most websites have Google or Facebook trackers, many have both. So just about wherever you are, there's data going back to Google and Facebook. Uh, and it often goes back before you've even agreed. As soon as you click on the platform, bang, the data's gone. So if you want to see, determine whether or not you agree or not, too late, it's gone. So, uh, and they also get a lot of data because they dominate advertising technology, they dominate uh, data analytics, so they're getting data from a whole range of ways, which is not surprising. As I say, that's their business system, to gather data and monetize it. That's, that's, that's the business they're in. They never describe it that way, but that's absolutely the business they're in. And there's a close link here between the competition, consumer and privacy issues, because you are, when you use these services, you're paying with your data. I mean, they're free, of course, but you're paying with your data. There's just no other economic way to analyse what's going on here. Um, and because the um, payment you're making is so unclear to you, it's hard to get competition um, in terms of the way you pay. It's hard to understand that you can use Google and this is the information that they'll have on you. If you use DuckDuckGo, they, they get very little information on you. But most people don't know that. They're not making that, that trade-off between um, a search engine and, and the data that they're giving up. So there's competition issues here. There's clearly consumer issues in terms of what do consumers understand? Are they misled? And of course, there's, uh, there's privacy issues. So these three things just interlink all the time. You've got a very opaque digital advertising market. I mean, the digital advertising market is just fantastic. So when you go onto the website, um, any old website, not, not, but doesn't happen all the time, it happens a fair bit of the time, within a nanosecond of you entering that website, they're auctioning off who wants to advertise to you. So that advertisement you get is not chosen a week ago, it's chosen within the last second or so. Um, that's how the, the system works, very sophisticated, um, but unclear uh, how much, you know, if you buy $100 of advertising, how much of that gets taken by the people in the middle and how much gets taken, how much actually appears as an ad. Uh, and I suspect the minority of it appears as an ad, the rest of it goes to various middle people who make up this wonderful auction. And we don't know really whether there's self-preferencing there, that is to say those who dominate ad tech, which is particularly Google, are they self-preferencing? And we just don't understand very much about this market, which is the source of the main complaint from Google's and Facebook, but particularly Google's competitors, that, that somehow uh, they can't compete because of what Google or Facebook is doing. And that's an issue uh, competition regulators around the world don't fully understand yet, and they are allegations. They're certainly not, not proven. I think a big issue is that consumers just do not, clearly do not understand the amount of data collected and the use to which that is put. We did a survey and it sort of showed that people are aware that Google and Facebook are collecting your data because they know they're getting ads that can only be based on their use of the, of the platform. But when we ask people 
Are you comfortable to be tracked by Google and Facebook when you move off their platforms and roam to other platforms? About 80% said no. And when we said, do you mind being profiled in the way that you're being profiled? Most people said no. Um, so, you know, 80% again. So when we showed people in a, what we'd like to think was a flat way, this is what's going on, do you mind? 80% um, generally said yes, they mind a lot. Uh, and look, privacy is one of those very subjective things. There's going to be people in this room who could not care less. They don't really, couldn't care less what companies know about them. And there's another group who are probably outraged, and there's a range of you in the middle occupying different parts of that spectrum. It is an emotive topic, but I think it's really clear that consumers don't understand what's going on. And partly that's because the privacy policies are actually permissions to use policies. If you ever want to read the Facebook or Google policies, just have a read of what they're saying, and you're giving permission. Um, because the, the policies themselves are very long, very complex, very vague, and very difficult to navigate. Now, I must admit I've never tried to navigate them, but people who've got much more, and I'd fail anyway, but that's not a test. The people who make up our digital platforms unit, who are certainly on average less than half my age, uh, they've tried in various which ways and cannot, I mean, if you control your profiles, then things get changed and you've got to go back in and do it again. It's just very hard to do that. And I have to say, it's not surprising, that's the business model. The business model is to get your data and to monetize it. So um, there's also bundled agreements. I mean, it's very hard if you want to use Google or Facebook to actually get out of giving them data because if you do, you can't use the platform. And if you're on Facebook, you've got to stay on Facebook because that's the way you're connecting, getting family photos and things. And of course, Google, most of you probably couldn't have got here without Google. Um, so, uh, then you start to think about, well, what are the harms here um, from having all this data? And that's really interesting. Um, there's just this ability to exploit behavioural biases. And again, we don't fully understand how much this is going on. And certainly, I don't think Facebook or Google take much responsibility for it. Um, but, you know, you hear stories of people getting tar people who've got gambling issues getting targeted with gambling ads, um, people getting targeted with high interest loans when they're desperately short of cash at just the right time when they're short of cash. By the way, you've only got to tick the box that it goes straight into your bank account. So they had your bank account. Um, I'm not saying that's universal, but I certainly know of one case very clearly where the bank account was there, you just had to tick and the money went straight in. And then the interest started clicking over. But, you know, discriminating in all sorts of ways uh, uh, that can affect um, uh, insurance and a range of other things. And the other one which is fascinating is that old topic of consumer surplus. So if you go and buy a cup of coffee and you're like me in the morning, you pay $3.50 for it, but how much would you have paid? Oh, on some mornings about $20. That's a consumer surplus of $16.50 that I've made because I'd have paid $20, I don't have to pay $3.50. But the more they know about you and can profile you, then the more they can work out how much you would actually pay. How desperate is Rod for a cup of coffee this morning? Bang, $20 for you, sir. Now, it doesn't work that way, of course, because there's enough coffee shops around. Um, but that ability to target people and work out how much they're willing to pay is another interesting aspect. Um, then you've got, of course, the use of data that's made in terms of what happened with Cambridge Analytica. I realise this is getting outside our remit at the ACCC. Uh, but that ability to profile for political purposes, disinformation, um, scams uh, and the like uh, is also there. And the other issue, of course, we hit on very strongly because it was a key part of our terms of reference, is the impact of all this on, on the media. Now, it was put to me early on that we shouldn't care about the media, this is just creative destruction, just as the horse and buggy was made redundant by the motor vehicle or Kodak demise with digital cameras. Why do you care? Well, we care because Google and Facebook are not providing the news. They're just grabbing it from everybody else and supplying it to you, um, which is great. It 
it, it's got many advantages, don't get me wrong, but it means that but, but they're, they're taking the ability of the media, they're massively reducing the ability of the media companies to monetize their content. Uh, for example, if you spend a lot of time getting the first story up, uh, then it, you, you go down the, the priority list within seconds as somebody else puts something else up. So it's very hard to monetize original journalism. Um, it's um, very hard to be a subscription service because that gets you uh, lower down the ranks. Um, it's hard to... Uh, get access to the data about what people are watching on the media because that data is held by Facebook and Google to some extent and it's very hard to work out how to advertise against your content because that's determined by Google and Facebook. Um, and of course they're also atomizing the news. So it's very hard to build a brand when there's news sites that people go to to get their news and they don't know where they're getting their news from. So there's all, and of course Google and Facebook want you on their site not on the publisher's side. So uh, there are various ways in which media is getting adversely affected. And why we care about that is media is what in economics is known as a public good. That is, we all benefit from the media being there, even if we don't buy the newspaper or read it or pay, subscribe online, because the media holding people to account, uh, be it governments, they occasionally hold the ACCC to account, which of course is very annoying, but I understand why that's done and, and, and that does provide a good service to having an informed democracy, having organisations knowing that if they're doing the wrong thing, that will get exposed. Um, so we desperately need the media, but it is finding it very hard to monetize its content. The main way that's being reflected is in local journalism, a lot of local newspapers have closed down in many countries, including Australia, uh, because they, they just can't survive anymore. So there's a lot of regions in Australia that no longer have a newspaper. But even the main national papers are, are struggling because of the impact of the digital platforms. And I don't think it's sort of deliberate. It's just their business model is making it very hard for the media. So a range of issues there in terms of... Um, keeping my eye on the clock here firmly so that that little bell doesn't ring. Um, so we, uh, I think, explained all of those issues in our report. Uh, you've just had the short version. The report's 650 pages long if you'd like to read it. I don't think many people have, but a lot of people have read the executive summary. We put a lot of time into that. So we've exposed, I think, a lot of issues and one of the reasons why the report has been well received is it was broad. It did explain what was going on. It was an inquiry. It wasn't an investigation looking for a breach of the Act. No, no, it was an inquiry explaining what's going on and that's what we like to think we've done. We did make 23 recommendations to government. Um, we tried to come up with solutions for each of the problems we identified. We also recognise that we're at the start of this journey and whatever we set up needs a continuing flow of information so governments and society can stay ahead of these, these issues. Roughly the sort of things we recommended was having making unfair contract terms illegal, having an unfair practices provision. Uh, I know every business organisation in the country hates the idea that there'd be a provision against unfair practices and if you look at their submissions to the to our inquiry, that's exactly been their reaction, but there's unfair practices provisions in the United States, the EC, Canada, Singapore, um, UK, and so forth. We're the outlier. We don't have that such a provision, but just about every other country does. And it's important because there's no other way to capture some of this behavior. Things like the bundled agreements, where you can only use it if you agree to a whole range of things which could be seen as inappropriate, or the scams that are going on uh, that don't get taken down when everybody knows it's a scam and they haven't taken it down, yet it does enormous harm because people are losing a lot of money, yet it's not taken down. Uh, we're suggesting changes to the merger laws, um, particularly to take account of potential competitors uh, because the 
Google and Facebook have grown massively by acquisition, billions of dollars spent on hundreds of acquisitions. Um, and this is, again, something that's going to take off around the world. We're suggesting that the unit that did the work keeps going and keeps monitoring these, these issues so that there's a continuing flow of information to governments, but also that we start moving into an enforcement mode. We're recommending that privacy laws change. At the moment, both in Australia and the US, the, the model is basically um, give you information and let you make a choice. Let you know what's going on and you make a choice. That's how the privacy system largely works. It's completely not working anymore. You're not informed about what's going on and even if you were, you've got no choice because your choice is getting off Google or Facebook and not many people want to do that. So we need a, to modernise our privacy laws. We need proper consent. We need an ability to consent to this and not that, which we don't have. We need new definitions of what's personal data. Um, uh, we need an ability to er erase data. And we need to require the digital platforms to just tell us very clearly what data's being collected and what's being done with it. That is fundamental. Now, that'll be more information than anybody in this room, prob no, not everybody, but a large number of people in this room need. But if it's there, then journalists, privacy advocates can understand that and make that known. At the moment, we just don't know, and we should know. We've suggested a bargaining code between the media organisations and Facebook and Google, respectively. That's because there's no... It's just very uneven bargaining at the moment. Um, you, uh, uh, the media is dealt with on a take it or leave it basis with the platforms at the moment. Um, and that's because the platforms, of course they need the media as a whole, but they don't need any particular media company. Whereas every media company needs the digital platforms. They cannot exist without the digital platforms. So um, that bargaining code is pretty fundamental. People ask me, well, will it work? And part of my answer is it's already working. The fact that all this has come to light, there's been a lot of deals done. I noticed Robert Thompson was in The Australian today talking about how the, the landscape's changing and they're, 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 they're able to interact better with the digital platforms. And that is because of the focus on the issue, the focus worldwide, but I think some of the focus that we've put on it. So just evening up that bargaining position I don't think will do much harm to the digital platforms, but it will enable the media companies to monetize their content a lot better, and we will all be for the we will all benefit from that. Other recommendations are things like um, takedown for disinformation, misinformation, copyright, and establishing uh, an ombudsman who can settle disputes between businesses, consumers on the one hand, and the platforms on the other. At the moment, it's you don't even have a, it's very almost impossible to contact the platforms, much less settle a dispute. So uh, we believe each of those recommendations, and I've summarised them roughly, address particular harms. Uh, and uh, therefore, we think for each problem, we've come up with a solution and we've also set up a system of having a continuing flow of information. So, look, in conclusion, uh, I think with digital platform issues, we are at the start of a journey. Someone's likened it to uh, someone invented cars, and so you needed road rules. You needed traffic lights. You needed... So we've got platforms, but we don't have the rules, and we do need to have the rules. Uh, we're not trying to do with that away with platforms, and I should have said up front, if it's not already obvious, that we benefit enormously from the platforms. I mean, wonderfully creative. The, the benefits we get from Facebook and Google are enormous, but just because we get benefits doesn't mean we shouldn't be dealing with the harms because these platforms are transforming society in so many different ways, particularly around use of data. So, look, I think there's a sensible start being made by our report. There's a lot of lobby... The government is committed to uh, responding to our report by Christmas. There's a wonderful amount of lobbying going on, left, right and centre. So uh, we particularly will wait with interest to see how much of it, many of our recommendations survive the lobbying effort.
Thanks very much.